story about a bird that uh, uh, that comes from one of one of our, our, our deeper stories, I, and these deeper stories have to do with a trickster within our community, and uh, it's uh, uh, the trickster is in Ojibwe uh, is called Nanabojo, and you could be Nanabojo, right? Uh, the tree could be Nanabojo. Anything could be Nanabojo. Right? For the Cree people, is Wisagi Jack the same person? And this could be anything and everything. And Wisagi Jack walks among, amongst us. Um, Nanabojo walks amongst us. And the spirit of these of these uh, of this teacher is that it could turn into anything. And one day. Nanabojo turned into a bird about this time of year and flew around to the trees and asked, you know, will you help me? You know, will you help me? It's getting cold out. And these trees, the ones that you see here, said no. And so the bird flew to the next tree and asked the same question and got the same answer. And then flew again and again the same answer. And so then this bird, Nanabojo, which was the bird, flew to a, a like a, a pine tree or a cedar tree and asked that question like will you help me and keep me warm during the winter and that, that tree said yes you, know, you, could, you could stay here as long as you want and we'll look after you and then um, so Nana Boja flew and said you know for your gift of sharing you could keep your green leaves all year round huh? and for you guys you'll lose your leaves every year to remind you that you don't share your spirit has to has to leave. Right? So, you know, that, that teaches you the idea of, of, of you know, sharing, and of, uh, of being, you know, responsible to things around you. Right? For like half my year, for like uh, 42, I've been here, it's not, it's not here since 18. I'm 42. And then in institutions, eh? Yeah. Jails? This community is a direct result of my two brothers being dead, eh? And countless cousins have OD'd and died, and countless friends have been shot, killed, murdered, you know, missing, whatever, you know, like, um, like, I'm determined to uh, try and show people that there's a different way. And I'm convinced that there is a different way to do things. I always thought that going to men for love was... Because my mother never gave me love. And I never got anything from my father as well. So I always thought going to men for love was getting paid and... Having sex with him for, for it. I felt so good to be, you know, in a gang, in the gang that I was in. I was so happy, you know what I mean? Like once I once I joined, I felt I felt so good, you know, like and I, that's all I wanted to do is impress the bo like, you know, the boys. And my goal my goal when I was a kid, my goal was to make it to federal, but by the time I was eighteen just so I could become a more a more known, well-known gang member, you know what I mean? That's what, that was my goal when I was a kid, you know, like, you know, I wanted to be in the federal prison just, just so I could make my way up there.
in life they tell us there's two roads in life. Mikan and we call them. That first road, Minupimat is in, we call it the good life. This is that road we walk when we're practicing those seven sacred teachings love, respect, honesty, humility, courage, wisdom, and truth. When we walk those, those teachings, that's that road we walk. That other road over here, we call that one Machimikana, the bad road. This is that road we walk when we're doing alcohol abuse, drug abuse, family violence, lying, stealing, cheating, all those kinds of things. That's our road that we're walking when we do those, they tell us. But again, those old people, they always remind us, just as there's teachings on that road, there's also teachings on that road too. That alcohol, for example, that's a medicine, they tell us. That cocaine, that's a medicine. That heroin, that's a medicine. Anything that comes from Mother Earth is a medicine. But what happens when we don't respect something? It can come back to hurt us. And that's what we see today in our families, in our communities, and that, is that people haven't respected those medicines the way they're supposed to. culture for our people, for Indian people, Aboriginal people, whatever you want to call us I mean, in the city here, has always been, uh, it doesn't have a long history of, of, of being something that's been good. You know, it has a long history of uh, putting things back together, you know, bringing things uh, back to life. You know, my, my own experience is, uh, like I grew up in the city. You know, I come from, I guess, a fairly large family. My my relatives had larger families, and what I think happened with my family is they 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 kind of fled, you know, and were always looking for safety and, and acceptance, and uh, you know, to to be seen as human beings, and we ended up, you know, in in. Uh, in an area of town called the North End of Winnipeg, where we lived by the tracks that you guys videoed. Mostly what I think about when I think about that time is I think about, you know, how uh, uncool it was to be Aboriginal, you know, growing up in a time where, you know, racism, discrimination was really very much alive and very, very open to our people. The North End has always been a place of, of a lot of uh, alcohol abuse, you know, a lot of abuses of all, all, all types. Like I'm 50 years old and I grew up around a time in which, you know, men were coming back from the war. So you had people who came from the war who, you know, had killed people, you know, and, and were around a lot of violence. And they came back to you know, an area of town where there was little employment and little opportunity. So they were very violent and very controlling people, and the men I'm talking about. Uh, and that's built over into how the young people behaved and how the young people lived their lives. Eh? So when you break down, you know, a hierarchy of, of, of poverty, Aboriginal people were always at the bottom. Our, our disadvantage was our our color, our disadvantage was our, our way of life, and more accurately, you know, we became the ass end of, you know, everybody else's problem.
of the first things that you'll see when you enter Urban Circle is um, the traditional colors that we have throughout our building. Um, they represent um, different people that we deal with in everyday life. Part of that is our circle of life. Um, we have the yellow which represents the eastern nation. We have the black which represents the southern nation. The red which represents the first nations, Métis, Inuit. And then we have the white which represents the Caucasian people. Um, we have presently 20 employee, employees at Urban Circle. Three men, 17 women. Um, which we kind of find quite ironic, but I think one of the things in the uh, First Nations culture is that women are usually the ones who do, um, whether it be erecting the teepee, whether it be picking the medicines, um, the cooking, looking after the children, that's a very important job. And so that could be why we have so many females working here. I think one of the things you'll notice that as we're walking through Urban Circle that there's a very relaxed feel, that um, students find it very comfortable, very inviting, very warm and that's what we want for our students to be coming here that the population is of the same kind so that we can learn from one another and then be able to walk up there as good ambassadors um, that's important for our students also to do that when they're employed to walk as good ambassadors to teach others what it means to be First Nations in a good way not just the drugs the alcohol the gangs um, living on assistance, but what else there is because it is a very beautiful culture. It's very accepting and it's very open for all to learn. So we're at different stages of the, we, we have students who have um, come back to us with a kind of grade six uh, education, so the last time they were in school they may have been 10 or 11. Um, or they could have finished the grade 12 if they're coming into our post-secondary. So we have a really wide range of experiences and abilities. Um, but because uh, we are able to take a, a little bit more time to go through the courses, because we have the counseling support, um, they get a lot more supports than they may uh, at another adult learning center. Walking through our door is the first step and, and we're able to provide them with those supports. But then when, we, when they graduate and they have to go and walk through an employer's door or go on to one of the larger universities, um, we, we want to give them the skills so that that's not as difficult. Uh, obviously it's still always going to be a bit challenging, a bit nervous uh, and nerve wracking the first time, but um, emotionally, uh, culturally, uh, academically, they're going to have like a, a toolbox that they're able to um, use to support them in that process. Is that alright if it's like... She said just not try to pull the roots. Yeah, I think that's fine. It's gonna dry up. Oh. So they can still use it when some are dead? Yeah, because it dries out. Yeah, it's all gonna, we're gonna hang it like this and then it's gonna dry. Try? And sage is to, we smudge with sage every morning and we pray to the Creator. Um, sage is to clean, um, you smudge your, your eyes so you see good things of others, um, your mouth so that you're saying good things, you smudge um, your ears so you're hearing good things, so that you're, you're pretty much starting the day off fresh and clean and, and you know, um, it's just a new beginning almost every day. Each class goes and picks their own and we use it throughout the whole year so that at the end of the year if there's a little bit left, we give that to our elder, but we use that for our own personal, for each classroom's personal use all through the year. Just so they have a fresh start every day. If they might be having a bad day, you know, they come in and they smudge and then they feel better and then they can go about their day, kind of. Some students have that teaching, some don't. Some are only learning it now. Um, we like to teach and let them take what they want. If they, if they don't want to pretty, like to carry this on with their children, that's their choice as well. But we like to offer it to them and explain it to them. Many students took Sage home for them, for their families, so they can teach their families. And a lot of them have been telling me that um, they're sharing everything they've learned here with their families at home and they're hoping it continues on. <laughs> to wear a skirt is a form of respect to Mother Earth, um, to let her know that, um, that it's the women that are we're here to, you know, um, take the blessing that she's given us for the medicines that we need to get through every every day, every year. Um, so it's, it's, it's a respect for Mother Earth that we wear the skirts.
Can we use what? More matches. More matches. More matches. Those old people, they tell us life, life begins right here. And that's these first nine grandfathers that are right here. That first nine months when we're in our mother's womb. These first seven grandfathers, that first stage of life, that childhood stage. But again, those old people, they don't call it that. They call this one that stage of great learning. Because everything we learn over here prepares us the rest of that way. I was reading this book many years ago. Hmm? Everything you wanted to know about life you learned in kindergarten. Hmm? It made a lot of sense this book in that. Because eh? this is where we learn to be in relationship, to problem solve, to socialize. All those things that we learn over here prepares us the rest of that way. But again, long time ago, those old people, they tell us in that. Eh? There was teachings here, right from here. There was teachings there for those little boys. There was teachings there for those little girls. So that by the time they got over here, they knew what was in stock for them over here. And they knew all those things in that, eh? right from that first breath. That adolescent stage, that teenage years. Eh? But again, those old people, they don't call it that. Eh? This one here, they call this one the fast life. Eh? <laughs> when we get over here, around 12, 13, 14, we want to be over there. Can't tell me what to do anymore, right? <coughs> don't worry about it, I'll pick my own friends. Eh? Don't worry about it. I'll go to bed when I want. I'll wake up. Don't worry about it. Starting now, you have 11 minutes. Pens uh, don't stop moving. And I just want you to write your statement, your point of view, what you feel about this topic and the subject matter because this has been hard to talk about for everybody because we've all been affected. I told you I grew up in an abusive home. My father was violent. Both of my parents were alcoholics. And that's incredible. It's hard for me to talk about still. I'm 33 and it's still difficult to talk about. We've all experienced abuse and all different types of abuses in different ways. Maybe directly, maybe indirectly. So it's not easy to talk about. And I think we've got stuck there a couple of times where maybe it's too personal, maybe it's too painful, and we haven't released this stuff yet. I'm not expecting you or asking you to, every time we meet, relive this type of trauma, but we were brought together here to make a statement and to make this peace, and it's integral to the peace that we hear your voice. When you experience these statistics and these numbers for the very first time, and it starts to sink in about how many children are affected by abuse. When you start to look at the numbers to see how many women are affected by abuse, men affected by abuse. When you think about how you felt the first time you heard that. Brittany, do you have anything you want to share from your writing? <coughs> Who even invented abuse? My mother was a victim of, uh, of abuse, of violence against women. Uh, like when you're getting abused or whatever, and like when you don't do anything, they gain more power. And the next time they do it, they like think it's okay and they won't like feel anything, like no guilt when they do it. So by not doing something about it, they, they gain power through that? Not being able to stand up for yourself? Uh, you may not see it, but I can feel it. And then when I tell you, well, or then when I tell you, all I get is sorry. And then it's like, but I gotta live with it. And that's, you know, what I gotta deal with. I just hope one day you figure out right from wrong. Uh, a lot of my friends, like, uh, a lot of them that, like, in that, in that gang, like, like, a lot of, if you're in there, 
long not feel murder song or something. You know what I mean? Just like that. They'll set shit up for you. Yeah. I almost like should have been in jail too, but I didn't do it. I was like already in the guys right there. But I didn't pull the trigger, so yeah. So maybe that's a good thing. I don't want to be another statistic. I just want to go far in my life. I already came this far. Might as well go the distance. I basically get along with anyone. Even if like they do me harm, I'll still try and get along with them. Just because, you know, not everyone's bad. Like. Some people act bad, but really they're just trying to hide something most of the time, so. Yeah, I'd like to travel one of these days, but like, yeah, I have to finish up school and do like a bunch of good stuff. Like, I didn't even think I would make it this far. It's like when I was 14, I was really crazy. Everybody used to say I would just end up like a, my sister, a hooker on the street and stuff. Just laughed at them. I used to be very violent myself too. dominant institution that affected Aboriginal people that, that's well noted is the residential schools. In 1950, over half the treaty population in Canada were in those schools. And from that, you know, they experienced things like um, hunger, loneliness, and then you add on the issue where some were sexually and physically abused. A lot of them died in those uh, in those places, and the idea was to assimilate or or have them become part of the fabric of Canada. Right? So if your family didn't go to church, for example, right, your family you know uh, drank or whatever on the reserve or in the community, you know you 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 became a target. Or if you acted quote like an Indian, you became a target for that school. And these kids, after going to these schools for a number of years, they came back with, you know, no connection to their community. You know, they had lost their language by, by a forced uh, system. You know, they, they got punished for speaking, you know, a Cree, maybe an Ojibwe language, or Dakota or Lakota language. They were punished physically uh, for doing that. You know, they weren't taught to be parents. You know, they were taught to be, you know, basically you know, child laborers. So a lot of parents, you know, didn't know how to be parents, you know, when they did have children, so they lost them into care, right? A lot of these kids that, that we, we currently see, you know, have never had an opportunity to be raised by a parent. The vast majority have been impacted either through or with or within an institution developed by the state. And what I mean by that is foster homes, group homes, um, child lockups, and all of those things. Eh? The idea of institutionalization, you know, has always been the first and foremost sort of policy uh, to address the issues 
rather than looking at the issue of poverty and addressing the issues of poverty. The policies behind civilizing and assimilating us has always, you know, created some type of negative outcome. Uh, and that, that outcome being that, that, you know, the loss of rights, the loss of dignity, and more importantly, you know, the, the, the loss of culture and language. At one time, over a hundred years ago, that child, that child was at the center of all life. Those parents had a relationship to that child. Those grandparents had a relationship to that child. Those aunts, those uncles had a relationship to that child. Those cousins had a relationship to that child. The community had a relationship to that child. And in return, that child had a relationship with each of them. But a hundred years ago, the churches, they came to our communities. They took that child from that circle and they put that child in that square institution they called a residential school. And right from day one, they started to peel away from that child those relationships that that child had. And after three years, five years, nine years, peeling away from that child, all those relationships. Okay, go back now. Go back now. Nothing but gangs, North End. It's not only North End, this is Central. And we got the West, we got the West Side too, and it's, it's, all, it's all the same. Filled with, filled with our, our, my people, Aboriginal. And it's all, you know, it's, it's nothing but poverty and people are into drugs, you know, and then all the younger guys, the gang members, you know, they're all, they're all selling, you know? They're all hustlers. It, go, it goes far back, man, you know, before gangs, you know, like, as, as, as in for like, uh, residential schools and stuff like that. Like, a lot, a lot of the boys, you know, their parents were in there or else, their grandparents were in there, and it kind of the, the cycle of that went down to us. You know what I mean? Like a lot of us, like me, like a lot of us, we can't even speak our language because of that. You know, uh, like I didn't have a father growing up, stuff like that. Eh? It's like, and nowadays these young kids, you know, they they wanna they wanna impress the older guys, eh? The older gang members, so they'll do anything, eh? They'll murder somebody, you know, whatever. You know, it's it's happening. It's happened. Okay, I was 14 years old when I joined, but before before I joined when I was 14, I was already rolling with the gang, eh, before I joined. So I was with them for like basically my whole life. And uh, how I joined, you know, I, you know, you know, you get the beat down, you know, and then, yeah, it's pretty much like that. Like I have respect for people, man, like straight up, like uh, that's how it is with my gang, you know, we, we respect everybody, but if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're gonna cross our line, you know, and disrespect us, you know, we're gonna we're gonna shake the ground under your feet, man. Like straight up, you know what I mean? When you get out of a gang or drop out or something like that, nowadays you get killed, eh? Before like before my time in gangs, you know, you get a good beating, but now it's like you know, you'll get killed. We, we came to the program a couple of years ago. When we were working on Aberdeen, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, since then, he's you know, picked up skills with fixing houses. He's a good painter. Like seriously, he's a good painter. Right? You know, everybody sort of has some niche uh, you know, to them. Something that they're good with. And Roddy's been good with uh, with painting and, and such. But we also, you know. You know, talked about you know like a future, right? you know, and that future being that you know he would you know go to school and you know, look at something different in his life. And well, OPK started to just to give guys who got out of jail the opportunity for work. And we uh, we started working on just small projects like doing renovation work and you know, doing community work and all those type of things. 
and we eventually sort of, you know, you know, we kept that focus. We always kept that focus. We, we also do sort of cultural stuff. We allow for education. We try to make things happen. Just basically to stabilize and give something back to these young men that where there's nothing there. With the OPK and the, the whole training, you know, it makes me feel good to learn new skills, right? But the whole encouragement to better myself, you know, basically comes from him, you know, because he teaches me a lot, eh? Taught me a lot of stuff, man, like straight up, you know, like, and it, and it, and it makes me feel good. And when I, when I learn all this stuff, you know, I just want to share it with, with everybody, you know what I mean? Because everybody I know don't know it, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's like, Basically on the streets, you know, you don't, you don't know, you don't know the whole history about our people. You know what I mean? You know, we couldn't go. I couldn't go in just cold and talk to, you know, the people he, you know, his brothers and say this. He can. Well, it's a beautiful gift, man. You know, to find out who I really am. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it gives me that whole. Uh, um, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, It makes me feel good, you know. It let, lets me know who I am. It makes it makes me want to change my whole life. You know what I'm saying? Like, it makes me want to stop warring with my own kind. You know what I mean? But I just can't stop with this like that, right? It makes me want to stop that. You know, it, it makes me want to, you know, go back to school. You know, because I, I I already am I'm back in you know I'm in university now. I never I never knew I never knew nothing about my culture, man. Like straight up, until I until I met Larry. Eh? All I knew was, oh, hey, this is a sweat, you know, this is uh, whatever. That, that's all I knew. But then, you know, I, to, to know what they're about, you know, it, it kind of gives you a... Uh, it makes you feel good, man, you know, you, about who you really are. You know what I'm saying? And I think, I think, I think stuff like that, you know, would help a lot of these kids, man. Like, that, that you know, to let them know who they really are, you know, because us killing each other all the time is it's not who we are, man. You know what I'm saying? The sweat lodge was given to Aboriginal people from what I heard from hanging around sweats, uh, you know, around a very confused time within our, within our people. And uh, the ceremony in and of itself, you know, has a lot of teachings, a lot of um, explanation as to why the sweat is the way it is. And it was believed it was start, it was started by a quest by a young boy who uh, seen his people suffering and walked and looked for answers and was eventually told that the answers were right in front of him. And that meant, you know, that, that the people had the answer to the issue and, and suffering that, that we were going through. From that grew this, this ceremony called the sweat. And, and again, I don't know when it started or how long it's been around, but it's been around for a long, long time. You know, throughout North America, sweats are done as far south as New Mexico, and as far north as the Arctic. And people all do it within a different way. The teachings are a little bit different in each of, uh, in each of how it's, it's, it's made and the ceremony you do within that, that sweat. But it's all put together to heal your mind, body, and spirit. When you go into the sweat, the belief is you're going to the womb of your mother, and you you crawl into the sweat, and you, um, as as respect, you know, for that spirit or those spirits, those rocks that they heat up uh, in the fire. We call them grandfathers, and they. Our belief is that you know they've been here so long, you know they they've been around so long that that. When they go into that sweat lodge after they're heated, they give their spirit up to us to cleanse us. When we go into that sweat, it's completely dark. You don't see a face, you don't see a color, you don't see a person 
for what they are, but rather it's complete blackness. So we're all equal. And we all get to share our stories, our lives, our, our suffering, our pain, and our and our our goals, what we want to be and what we how we want to be. Um, so that sweat is is seen as 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 medicine, as the way in which we heal as a people. And if you see it and and you know, see the shape of it. It's, it's shaped like a dome. It represents a pregnant mom. And we go in there and we come out uh, reborn, if you want to call it that. A, a rebirth of who we are. That adult stage, eh? that adult stage, again those old people they don't call it that. That one there they call that one that stage of great responsibility. Eh? Because in life when we get over here somewhere, eh? that's when we come together with that other person. Eh? But with that comes responsibility. Eh? After a while we'll walk like that, things are going pretty good. Then we invite that life. Eh? Next thing we know we got that little bundle in front of us totally, totally dependent upon us to nurture it, to protect it, to feed it, to clothe it. Eh? Our responsibility, lots of responsibility. Eh? But that's what they call that one, that stage of great responsibility. Because we learn all those things over here so that we can become responsible. Eh? There was teachings there all along the way. You hear gunshots in the neighborhood all the time. Like gun violence, uh like it's a scary thought, eh? Like, you know, I'm happy that my children don't stay with me, eh? Because this is a really crummy area, eh? You know, I didn't even want to grow up here. <laughs> Why would they be here? Like, my children now are in foster care. They're white as well. They're not. They don't look native. I haven't seen them in five months. CFS won't let me see them. And although I've been trying really hard to get off the drugs, it's been... It's been really depressing. <laughs> you know. You know, when you're young in this community and you grow up and everybody's around you is messed up on drugs and alcohol, I mean, which way are you going to go? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, you know, like... Like, it's, it's, it's normal, you know? Just a lot of things, a lot of trauma I went through growing up. I could never fathom my children going through that. If it wasn't my father beating me, it was my mother. So. I don't know how many times me and my brothers tried to save her from my father beating her and she'd turn around and beat us up. She'd get so drunk that she wouldn't remember nothing. Or my father, it's, it's beyond me why a person gets that drunk and not, you know, go past their limit kind of thing. And I guess that's the same with the crack, I guess, for me. One is never enough. And 12 is never, you know, never too many either. <laughs> 
Like you got a lot of people that are harboring some real deep uh, uh, feelings on, on the kind of things that happened to them when they were growing up, eh? Like, you can't just put that stuff in a box and put it away eh? and forget about it and try and move on with your life, eh? Like, you'll never do that if you uh, don't come to terms with what happened to you, you know, like in your life, eh? Mine started with my father and <clears throat> it sexually abused me and because he couldn't have his way with me, he basically kicked me out, told me I had to go on my own. <clears throat> my mother didn't have no say in any of it. She just um, went with whatever he said. We got child prostitution going on and there's some fucking white rich guy sitting in a fucking Cadillac. And he's got a fucking 12 year old child sitting beside him and he's gonna take her somewhere and do things with her. Like that's rape, eh? Like the last time I looked at that, that's rape, eh? That's exploitation of a child, eh? And that's wrong, eh? And you wanna talk about the issues? Then that is an issue for me. I, I do see a lot of young girls out there, quite a few. I mean, I walked up to them and said, what are you, 12? You know, and they're like, no, I'm 18. I said, don't bullshit me, you know. You're not 18. They're probably about 14, 15, if anything. Because I was brought up, my father kicking me out young, I had to go on independent living when I got pregnant, my first child. And because of that, putting me into CFS, that ruined my life totally. Like, me ever having a family, a, a normal family life, it was because of them. After being institutionalized most of my life and all my friends being institutionalized and stuff like, we we see it for what it is, eh? Like, you know, it's a form of genocide, eh? You know, like we we dominate the prison system here in Canada, like we totally dominate it, you know. When you go into Stony Mountain, it tells you right on the wall, it says, walk softly, Whitey, you're in Indian land. You know, I still have to hang on to my faith, my hope. I still have a desire to want to live and, and have a good life. And see my first two children before I go. See my, all four of my kids together. We're Indian people and we're survivors, eh? We survive, eh? We, we adapt. So we'll take all of this stuff we have here and we'll take it all on. And in the end, we'll be okay, I think. There's three things that, that, that Indian Act policy and Aboriginal policy aimed at. The language, the culture, and the land. If you understood your language, you respected your culture, and you would defend the land. So every policy that was put in place was to cut our feet off from the land. So there was no more need to have a, a place of our own. Eh? That there was no, no, no more need to have a culture and our language then became secondary. The main idea, and the, the first and foremost idea, is to eliminate and eradicate the rights and, and being of an Aboriginal person. It's, it's a form of genocide, you know, just done in, in, in a more slower way. You know, through history there were peaks in which it was done very obvious and very hard, you know, through diseases, through residential schools, you know, through elimination, like basically, you know, murder of our people. You know, nowadays, it, it's just we slowly eat away at ourselves until we have nothing. You know, that somehow, some way, that we can't reflect upon who we are, that we can't understand who we are, and more importantly, we, we, we become disconnected to this place we call Mother Earth, and how important she is. 
She's our main, main teacher and our main person that we survive from. So we need her. And that's a universal thing. But somehow, some way, you know, throughout time and throughout history, our practice of, of uh, and our expression of that was under attack because we believed and loved her so greatly that we were prepared to die for her. That elder stage, that last stage of life, Again, those old people, they don't call it that. They call that one that stage of great wisdom. Because when we think about it, we've traveled all the way from here and all those different experiences that we've had along that way. By the time we get over here, we have that wealth of knowledge. Eh? So now we become the teachers. It's our responsibility to pass that on, that knowledge. And, eh? I bring that balance here to uh, for people to know their proud heritage as opposed to what had been said through time and history of the residential schools and and to have uh, that balance each day. And you see all these circles here, the circle of life. A reminder, are they in balance? You know, are they taking care of their spiritual needs, their emotional needs, their mental, and also their physical. Each day you must have that to be in balance. There's a need to get this out, the awareness to open doors for these uh, boys and, uh, because they're lost, they're lost. It doesn't fit when they try to be like somebody else. You know, even myself, if I try to do what you do, it wouldn't fit in my life. So, in that sense, that's my understanding, you know, to do their own thing and to, to find their place in, in society and yet learn along. And we're so uh, fortunate that some of our elders that had kept the teachings and they, had, they moved to the bush and mountains and kept our traditional things buried. And when it was time, brought them and they started to teach again. That awareness start coming. And through a lot of fear was instilled in us in residential school. Um, I myself fight with it every day. called the seventh generation and there was a white buffalo calf that was born in the um, Minnesota, South Dakota uh, no, about uh, 19, uh, six, let me see, 70, no, 1996 it was and this was a sign of a prophecy of long, long ago of the white buffalo calf woman that there will come a time, and our elders tell us we're living in this time, when our children will be well again. In Aboriginal culture, people are um, seen as important for the gifts that they have, and that no matter what stage of life you are at, and that's the medicine wheel, that it's the infant, 
the youth, the adult, and the elder, wherever you are on the medicine wheel, and of course there are many interpretations of the wheel, but you are where you're meant to be and you continue to be part of that circle of life. And for me, what greater gift is there than to be part of the family here? And I always will be. For, and, and I believe everyone here feels the same way, that we have found community in a time historically when community is so fractured, when the marketplace has become the only community left, because our spirituality is so very fractured now. It's not, uh, it has very little significance for our young people, for example, and they're searching for something that touches them and is of relevance to their life. There's an embracing of the four nations on the medicine wheel, the white, the black, the yellow, and the red. And uh, that's the vision of the elders, that we all work together, that we need to uh, understand one another's gifts, but to be joined by this single heartbeat. You know, I was much younger and uh, they, those old people, eh, when they would talk, when they would finish, they'd always finish off with, Ah, Sandhine Magana, all my relations, they would say. And being young and cocky, I'd sit there and that, eh, I'm not related to you, we're not blood, but I've come to realize what that means. It's through those life experiences that we all share that makes us related. It doesn't matter who we are, where we come from, if we're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. It's when we share those experiences, mm -hmm. that understanding that we become related. Mm -hmm. I forget when I'm driving down Main Street and I see that stinky, smelly, old, dirty bottle, mm -hmm. worthless, nothing, no good for nothing. Mm -hmm. I forget mm -hmm. what happened to him. Mm -hmm. What happened to him? Why he's where he is today? Mm -hmm. I forget. Or else when I'm driving down Alice some nights in that day, I see that girl standing in the dark corner alley there. I forget right? what happened in her journey. Right? Why night after night she has to stand in that dark corner and allow those men to come and abuse her body in that day. I forget. Right? And part of why I share this story is to remind all of us, before we judge one another, that we need to get to know each other yeah. and to see where it is that that person is coming from, what's happening in their journey that has made them into who they are. Mm -hmm. We can go through life in two different ways. One, poor me, poor me, poor me, poor me, poor me. Yeah. We can choose to walk our life in that way or we can choose to walk our life and do something about it. Yeah. It's a choice. And so many days have come and gone, and tomorrow comes too soon. I hope someday I can live for today, and tomorrow will always be tomorrow. And even though the days go by so fast, and no one thing that will always last, my love for life and my children's smile, I know getting better will take a long while, but I'm willing to walk that long, hard mile. Freedom is probably the most important thing to our people. You know, it's the thing that we, we, we dream about. Right? You know, freedom from oppression, freedom from poverty, you know, freedom from the brutality of, of what society has sort of laid upon us. Huh? And, and I think that, that until we die, you know, we have to stand up and we have to stand up for who we are and what we're about because the goal is the absence of, of, of oppression, the absence of, of you know, this, this world that's imposed itself upon our, our culture and our people for hundreds of years. And we now 
are in the process of, of you know moving forward but we have to move forward you know with the idea in mind that we will be free and that freedom is achievable of genocide. Twelve score and more years ago, we went from being the majority to being the smallest minority. Now you want us, now you want us to cry your tears for you. We saw that empty early morning skyline. Back through that horizon, the valley 1979, wounded me, sand creek. That trail of tears. Exactly how did our land become your country? Now you want us. Now you want us to cry your tears for you. While we're still crying tears of our own. With your past as your future. That industrial ruling class. Using religion as a weapon. Distilling love into hate. Pointing fingers and name-calling evil. Sacrificing lives and blood. Making the innocent the new virgins. Offerings to the gods of profit. Now you want us. Now you want us. To cry your tears for you. 